It's my pleasure to introduce our guest for the day, Professor Michael Frank, Professor of Eclipse, and also the director of Carney's Center for Computational Brain Science. So Michael, welcome and please take it away. All right, thanks. Yeah, okay, so I was asked to give a, an overview about models of decision-making and I'm gonna you know, try to do it fairly uh, quickly, although it's, that's a bit of a challenge because I wanna cover um, sort of the different levels of analysis and what they might be, how they might be brought to bear for asking different kinds of questions. And I suspect uh, some of that might come up in the questions later as to, you know, what is the appropriate level of analysis and what kinds of questions can these models be used for. Um, so I'll go over, you know, some behavioral models and some sort of more mechanistic neural models and uh, possibly discuss ways in which um, those two can be linked to each other each other to, to test hypotheses about the neural mechanisms of decision making um, and then as part of that discussion about the level of analysis that's applied um, maybe we'll also be able to discuss you know when do you care more about the potentially realistic nature of the actual generative model of the brain that produces decisions versus statistical questions of what's the right way of um, sort of quantifying decision-making mechanisms in an experiment with any given level of um, resolution of data that you might have. So um, yeah, maybe we'll come back to that. Um, oops, sorry, I, I have to, there we go. All right, so this is just an overview of the sort of MAR levels of analysis um, and for, for decision-making, um, the computational level, uh, I sort of have two different equations here. The details are not so important, but the, uh, the, the second one is basically Bayes' rule, where a lot of the decision making involves uh, trying to make some inference about what's true in the world given some uncertain data. And so uh, the computational question there is uh, let, let's say you're trying to figure out whether um, uh, the classic task that I'll mention later is like a motion discrimination task where there's a lot of randomness and you're trying to figure out are the dots on the screen going mostly to the left or mostly to the right but you know there's lots of other um, questions that this can be applied to for example is a memory familiar or uh, or new and so forth uh, and in that case the Bayesian question is uh, what's the probability that the answer is things are going mostly to the left versus the right given the evidence that I've seen so far uh, and then you're trying to solve that by inverting uh, the likelihood of seeing particular evidence given that I had this hypothesis and uh, the prior hypothesis. Um, so that's one form of a decision is to try to make a decision about what's sort of true out there in the world. The other equation that I have up there is, that is also sort of at the computational level is what decisions do I need to take in order to maximize some value functions, some like future uh, sum of rewards. And that's something that comes up a lot in um, reinforcement learning. Uh, and those things are not these two different formulations are not really at odds with each other. You can change sort of the Bayesian hypothesis to uh, make your strategy to change its priors to sort of emphasize uh, making decisions depending on what you care about and what your value function is. Um, and then there's of course the question of, uh, those are just equations of trying to um, have an objective of knowing what's true out there in the world or trying to maximize rewards and how do you actually achieve that at the algorithmic level, uh, and how can that be used to explain sort of behavioral data? Uh, and so I'll go over a sort of a class of models that's applied to this question called sequential sampling models, most notoriously or most sort of uh, famously the drift diffusion model, and I'll unpack that in a minute. Uh, and then at the implementational level, there are different uh, neural circuit models of how different kinds of decision making might be implemented in the cortex and the basal ganglia. I just showed you a, a picture of two different models there. Uh, and that's for asking questions about neural dynamics, how they can, uh, how these models can account for uh, patterns of firing and patterns of bold data or EEG and so forth, but also how those things link to decision making. Okay, so um, like I said, the drift diffusion model is a very popular model. This is applied to uh, this random dots task that I should have on the top right, but as I mentioned, uh, and I'll mention it a little bit again, that that this model extends to lots of other uh, tasks. It's just, this is the easiest one to sort of motivate. In this case, there's a picture of a monkey kind of looking at a screen and there's targets on the left and the right. And it seems a lot of sort of dots moving randomly 
um, but on some trials, some of the dots sort of coherently move to the left and, and less of them move to the right or other directions. And so the monkey has to sort of sample the evidence across time to then decide should it respond to the left or to the right. Um, and so the drift diffusion model is a model that sort of summarizes this at the sort of algorithmic level. And it says, um, what I really need to do as a decision maker is accumulate noisy evidence across time. So time is going from left to right here. Um, and uh, it assumes that you're sort of starting somewhere between two boundaries, or sometimes referred to as decision thresholds, um, where you then, uh, the drift rate is proportional to the strength of the evidence. So in the uh, random dots task, it would be like if 10% of the dots are coherently moving to the right, the drift rate would move at a certain slope. But if it's like 50% of the dots, um, then it would move at a steeper slope. And then the sort of that drift rate is riding on top of uh, what is essentially Brownian motion in, in the models of physics, which is essentially like a random walk, which produces variability across trials. So each one of these little trajectories is a, one simulated pass through this, this model. And as soon as it reaches one of the boundaries, then a response is made. So it's sort of summarizing how a decision maker can start off not knowing what to decide somewhere between two boundaries. And then uh, sometimes for a given drift rate, because of noise, it'll uh, happen faster and sometimes slower. And each time, if you then plot the sort of a histogram of where the responses land, you see uh, the sort of heavy tailed X Gaussian shaped distribution, which looks a lot like uh, the distributions of response times that you see in a lot of uh, psychology decision making experiments, especially those experiments that have sort of one off decisions that take somewhere between like half a second and five seconds or something like that. Uh, and then also sometimes because of noise and also if the drift rate is low, sometimes the process will sort of drift to the other boundary and you'll make a mistake and you'll see uh, also distributions of response times. So this model has, you know, a few free parameters. There's lots of variants of it, but one of them is the bias that you, you might have like a prior bias to think that you should make a right response versus left response. You have a non-decision time, which is a parameter that just takes care of uh, the amount of time it takes to perceive stimuli and make a motor response that's not related to the the motor, uh, sorry, the decision process itself, and then for the core uh, decision parameters are the drift rate, which is you know how much evidence you have for one decision over another, and then the threshold, which is how far apart these boundaries are, um, and maybe I'll go through how those uh, can be disentangled in a minute, um, and. Uh, another point here is that these kind of models can be applied not only to things like random dots, but it can be applied to sort of value-based choice, like how much do you care about one option or another, or in this case, this is a, a picture from Andrew Westbrook, who's a postdoc in my lab, applying this uh, drift diffusion model to a task where people have to choose between uh, being offered different amounts of money, but also having to do different levels of uh, cognitive tasks that are hard or easy and people sort of balance that trade-off between wanting more money and not wanting to do such a hard task. And the whole process is additionally modified by, in this case, attention, depending on where people are looking, they might you know, focus on one attribute or another. I'm not gonna go into the details of this. Um, and uh, if we're talking about decision-making more broadly than just either of these two tasks, we might wanna consider lots of different factors like what's the reward utility function, meaning how much do you care about money and do you differentially weight large amounts of money versus small amounts of money? Uh, do you have different decision weights on the benefits versus costs of the potential consequences of your action? Do you care about risky choices? Um, there may be different amounts of weighting of intuitive sort of bottom-up processing of what I want to do versus deliberate uh, logical thinking or rule-based processing. You may have different weightings of speed versus accuracy. Uh, you may have different weightings of immediate versus delayed rewards. And all of those different things have are can be summarized in different mathematical models, and sometimes uh, behavioral economic models, uh, and all have different formulations. And uh, all of these are studied in different ways in terms of their neural mechanisms. So it really depends on you know what the question is and what we're addressing. And I could really only scratch the surface of that here. Um, in terms of the drift diffusion model, just to give you a sense of how these parameters can be used. Um, what I'm plotting here is sort of a grid where 
going from left to right, we're increasing the decision threshold. So you can see the drift is the same parameter, drift is one on from left to right. The threshold goes up from one, two to three. And you could see uh, what the effect of increasing that threshold is, is that the response time distributions get sort of elongated and more heavy tailed. Um, so people are slower, or the model is slower, I should say. But also that less of the noisy processes uh, terminate on the lower boundary. So this is a, a, a parameter that sort of you can think of as being more cautious. You're slower, but you're more accurate. And that parameter accounts for the sort of speed accuracy trade-off in decision making. And there's lots of studies that show that, you know, if you give people uh, even just an instruction to focus more on accuracy than speed, that's better. It's captured by increasing the threshold. Um, whereas if you move from t bottom to top, you can now... Uh, see that what we're manipulating here is the, the drift rate. So a drift of zero on the bottom means that there's literally no evidence. So if you're in a random dots task, for example, the dots are just going randomly. And so the drift can go equally to the right, to the top or the, the lower boundary. And as you increase the signal more and more, then you can see that uh, more of the, the sort of processes terminate at the higher boundary. So there's gonna be more correct responses. Um, but in the case of the drift, you, the more correct you are, the faster you are. And so the thing that's sort of interesting about this model is it allows you to decouple the joint distribution between not just which choices you're going to make and also not just how fast or slow you are, but what's really informative is the combination of how fast you are and on average how accurate you are for a particular condition. And the model can be uh, sort of fit quantitatively to distributions of choices and response times to sort of disentangle those processes. Uh, so there's many variants. The drift diffusion model is really just one of them. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of all the different models. It, it can be extended to have multiple responses. There are models that have some leak, which means that uh, it's not a perfect integrator as the drift diffusion model is. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about a lot, how a lot of these models can actually mimic each other. So these are really some people think of them as process models of what's going inside the mind, but you can also just think of them as statistical models that summarize the decision-making dynamics. Um, and so that also is interesting in terms of what kinds of, uh, you know, when do you care about the distinctions be the, between these models and when are they sort of nuisances? Um, and here are some other uh, variants, like the decision boundary can come down with time, and that is interesting for lots of reasons that I'm not going to go into. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm also going to skip that. Okay, so at the neural circuit level, um, there are a lot of models that try to summarize uh, different decision-making processes. One of the most popular ones on the left here uh, is an attractor model. This is uh, an example of a model from Xiaojing Wang's group where uh, A is representing a pool of neurons. So in the actual models, there's lots of neurons, not just one. Uh, and they have sort of recurrent connections between them. They're exciting each other. And there's another pool of neurons that respond to uh, B inputs and they excite each other and they both interact through a pool of inhibitory inner neurons. And this produces uh, an attractor-like dynamic that then can re recapitulate patterns of firing that you see in neural data in these sort of random dots tasks. And so, you know, those kinds of data are, um, if the motion strength in the random dots task is really high, you see neurons in relevant brain areas that seem to sort of accumulate evidence across time in a very steep way. It sort of looks like the drift process I was talking about before, but now it's uh, you know neuron spike rates. And then when the motion strength is less strong, it goes up less steeply and so forth. And if you plot those same neural activities aligned instead of to the stimulus onset to the response, you can see that they all sort of terminate at the same spike rate as if there's a, a common uh, decision threshold. And this kind of model is meant to capture those kinds of dynamics and make other predictions about the mechanisms that allow these sort of the integration and the sort of ramping like activity to occur across time. Uh, and this is another picture uh, of a similar model that is applied to value based decision making where there's sort of like high value and low value options and a, a distractor. Um, and at the bottom here, I have a picture of one of our own models from the cortical basal ganglia circuitry that uh, makes some predictions about what happens when you add the basal ganglia into one of these cortical networks, depending on uh, which allows it essentially to, to differently weight the reward and cost options of the, of the uh, 
or offer values of the different options and doesn't treat it as just simply rational perceptual decision making, but says, well, it's rational in the sense of trying to maximize reward. And there's all these sort of more detailed dynamics of the, the circuitry that I'm not going to go into, but you can ask questions about that in science by recording from those different brain areas and linking them to decision parameters. Um, and the last, very briefly, I wanted to say, well, those seem like very different levels of analysis, the sort of drift diffusion model and, and the, the like, and also behavioral economic models, and the, the models that are really trying to make some commitments about the different brain areas and the dynamics that are involved. Um, and they're usually used to ask different kinds of questions. Uh, and often when you're actually collecting real data in science experiments, you really have, you don't have access to all the relevant variables that will allow you to inform yourself about the parameters of a more biophysical or systems neuroscience model. And so we know that things like the drift diffusion model and the like are very good at uh, fitting quantitatively decisions and decision times, and you can estimate the parameters in a reliable way. Whereas you wouldn't want to take a model that looks like this and estimate all of its parameters just from coarse data, even if you had neural activity. And so sometimes you want to try to link you know, what are, the, what are the key computations that this kind of circuit model is performing in terms of another model that we can better estimate? This is sort of like the mean field approach in, in physics where you go from something that's really complicated to something that sort of summarizes uh, the key functions. And if you can make a link that says, uh, well, I'm not gonna go through all this uh, detail here, but uh, you can say, okay, there's a particular parameter of the neural model that if you manipulate it in a, in a monotonic way, it corresponds to a change in one of the diffusion model parameters. And if, if you can make that link, you could then say, okay, well now I'm gonna manipulate this neural uh, variable or I'm gonna measure it and then not use the detailed model to test it, but use the higher level model to then ask questions whether that link is uh, you know, viable or use it to sort of falsify or refine your models. And th there are different ways of doing that estimation, and you can link this to different kinds of neural signals, but uh, I am way over, I think, five minutes. So maybe we can just open it up to questions about what, when you would want to use these different kinds of levels of models.